Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And um, first of all, many thanks for joining us in such a beautiful day. This is always even more appreciated than, than, than ever. My name is Marius Dragomir, and um, I, I work uh, in Budapest. I'm the director of a, a research center called the uh, Center for Media, Data, and Society at the uh, Central European University. And I'm here today with a wonderful uh, panel to talk about Eastern Europe. Uh, we had already a number of panels in, in, in this festival tackling the situation in Hungary, talking about uh, media capture, which is a phenomenon that is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, affecting news media and journalism in Eastern Europe, but now we are going to, to tackle the, the issue of independent media uh, across the region, and we have uh, three uh, journalists working in, in three different countries. But before going into that, let me just tell you very briefly a few things about uh, about the, the, the key uh, dangers that, that independent journalists are facing. We have talked a lot during this uh, event and everybody is looking into the issue of media capture, which is a phenomenon of um, uh, increased and high level of government and oligarch control over the media. Uh, it is very much uh, marked, it is a phenomenon that is very much marked in, in this region especially, uh, and we spoke about Hungary as, as being the textbook case of media capture. Um, it's also a region that, uh, where, where journalism was very much affected by the uh, leave of foreign owners. We have been uh, at the center, we have been collecting data and following the situation of uh, foreign media owners in the region. And uh, in the past decade, 11 of the 17 most prominent foreign owners in the region left uh, uh, completely their businesses. Uh, the last one, in fact, was company from Sweden, MTG, which sold uh, its, uh, its asset in, in Bulgaria in, in February to a, a group of domestic owners. And talking about domestic owners, this is very important for the region because uh, it's important to, to, to look at the increase of the oligarchic uh, uh, local control of the media, which is not an, um, always very good. In fact, it's very bad in most of the countries uh, of the region. And the third point I want to make is the fact that we are talking about this, um, uh, this phenomenon and it, it is even more serious than, than we imagine simply because if you look at uh, the sources of capital in the media, there is a major accumulation of capital in the wrong places and we expect this, this phenomenon to continue in fact and to get even worse. But I know that you are very familiar with uh, journalists from Eastern Europe, Europe coming and complaining usually and uh, about the situation, so we don't want to do that here. Uh, this is a panel that will try to actually uh, have a more nuanced discussion about what is happening there to understand, to nail down what is the moment in time in this media capture attack on the media where you actually lose completely uh, your independence. But more than that, we are trying to debate something more constructive, and we are trying to understand how uh, journalists can increase their impact in the region. Already, the, the people you have here, they already do that. They have been doing that for, for many years, in fact, uh, in, in, very, uh, in very hostile environments, in fact. So without further ado, uh, I'll just quickly uh, ask my panelists to uh, introduce themselves. We have uh, Dragana Pecho, who's a Serbian investigative journalist working for CRIC, which is the Crime and Corruption Reporting Network in, in Serbia. And she's also doing work for OCCRP, which I think was very prominently presented in this festival. You are, I guess, all familiar with that. We have Boriana Jambazova, who's a journalist from Bulgaria, uh, and she has her work published in, in a number of uh, uh, very reputed publications, including the New York Times, The Economist, and, and Politico, among others. And we have Tomasz Bodoki from Hungary, who's an investigative journalist and editor, uh, and uh, based, in, based in Budapest, uh, Hungary, he has been a journalist since 1996, uh, before uh, Atlaso, the, uh, uh, the organization he works for, he had a stint with index.au, which is another prominent media outlet in Hungary. Before um, going into questions, let me just ask my panelists to quickly tell you what they do and what their organization is, is, is doing. So let's start with Serbia, maybe, Dragana. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
I am an investigative journalist at uh, CRIC, which is shortened for Crime and Corruption. Before that, I worked for several years uh, uh, at Center for Investigative Journalism of Serbia. And then one day, uh, my editor and a uh, few colleagues of mine decided to establish uh, new media. So that's a new website that it is uh, revealing uh, corruption and organized crime, and also some cross-border stories in cooperation with OCCRP. And our idea from the beginning was to uh, investigate corruption and organized crime uh, related to high officials. So th th those were the targets that, that uh, for us. So uh, for example, we created a whole database of uh, politicians' assets. Still, so far we have around 50 profiles of politicians. So this is a topic that is uh, most, uh, let's say, painful for them because if you are touching their property, then it's something that they really, really do, uh, don't like. Uh, for example, one of the first stories was uh, revealing a property of Serbian uh, President Aleksandar Vucic, who is, uh, back then was a prime minister. So because, as, as we figure out uh, now, uh, that they are usually don't buy property of their own name, like our president owns really small apartment, like 30 square meters, but we actually discovered that a lot more property owned by his family members. And uh, other stories are related to, uh, to uh, Belgrade Mayor, which we published uh, several years in 2015. So we revealed that Sinisha Malik, who was then uh, Belgrade Mayor, uh, actually bought 24 apartments uh, in Bulgaria on the seaside uh, as a director of two offshore companies. And there was also a story about him, how he, while he was working in the agency for privatization a long time ago, helped his father to privatize a the company, then how he and his family illegally obtained uh, 10 hectares of land, state-owned land in Serbia, and actually he was uh, the owner of the land at one moment, and then he sold the land to an offshore company, and the whole money ended up on his bank account. So this guy, there's a serious suspicion that he was uh, involved in uh, money laundering, and it's more than half a million euros. Today, this guy is a uh, Serbian finance minister, for example, so one of the closest uh, associates of uh, President Aleksandar Vucic. And there was also a story that we uh, managed to obtain a document showing that uh, a young doctor helped one of the most dangerous criminal uh, organized uh, crime groups in Serbia during the 90s, which was sentenced for assassinating uh, of uh, Prime Minister Zoran Đinđić. So he helped them actually when they was killing uh, criminals, their enemies on the street, and when they end up in a hospital, this young doctor helped them to finish these guys. So as a award, he was he, he got an apartment in Belgrade. That's what these uh, criminals, as uh, protected protected witnesses, was explaining on the court that they gave him an apartment in in certain block in Belgrade. We managed to uh, to get the document contract that ten days after the murder, this doctor had signed a contract to to uh, to uh, obtain this apartment from a wife of one of the leaders of the gang. And just after that, shortly after that, he sold the apartment. For example, this guy, this young doctor, is now, around 20 years later, Serbian Minister of Health. And for example, there, just after, these are just a couple of examples of the story that we were revealing from the beginning of when we started to, to work on it, and a lot of things happened. So a lot of things now are part of our job. A smear campaign, so many times that tabloids were attacking us because of we published certain stories. So, uh, for example, there, uh, after the story about uh, the Aleksandar Vucic, who was back then prime minister, there was uh, uh, my editor, Stevan Ducinovic, was on the cover on, on, on for several days on cover on, on Serbian tabloid informer. Like, mafia is attacking uh, family, Vucic, Vucic's family. Like, we want to uh, bring down the government and so on. So this is not, and it, these kind of smear campaigns, and we are not the only target of, this, <laughs> of these kind of smear campaigns, but the other investigative journalists also, like uh, my colleague Slobodan Gergiev from Balkan Investigative Journalism Network is here, he can share some thoughts with us. Mm -hmm. He was also <laughs> uh, 
uh, he was also on, on these uh, front pages, so usually they would like call us like uh, paid by foreigners, paid by Soros, uh, or we are, uh, want to bring down the government, we are state enemies. Once they published the uh, front page with uh, my editor saying that he's Saddam as a French spy. Uh, so uh, there were a lot of cases that, uh, like online harassment, like uh, on daily basis uh, it's normal that a lot of people, trolls and bots, write whatever they want about you so on, on, on social media. But it also happened that we received the death threats on social media that we all that uh, uh, written for me uh, and for all my uh, uh, for for our other colleagues in Creek that we should all line up and shot. And these cases, for example, are still in the prosecu prosecution's office. So nothing nothing happened after that. And also one case that usually people are now asking me and calling me to <laughs> on different conferences. Now I less uh, less speak about investigative journalism and the work I do, but more about the uh, situation in Serbia and more about the uh, safety of journalists because one case that happened to me uh, less than two years ago is that somebody broke into my apartment and made completely mess, didn't steal anything. And uh, after that, uh, police minister said that they, they will do their best to, to resolve the case, that they also uh, questioned some people that are actually from Bulgaria, which was then also funny because <laughs> of the stories uh, of apartments in Bulgaria of the minister. But uh, less than two years uh, later, nothing happened. Like we were following the case and write news and update about the case. Nothing happened and just after our news, Police send uh, report, for example, to prosecution, but nothing, nothing. Uh, they still didn't reveal uh, who did it. And also, uh, one story that is also interesting is about defense minister, Serbian defense minister. Uh, he bought a luxury apartment in Belgrade, uh, and he paid it uh, for 200,000 euros in cash. And till now, he can't explain uh, where the money comes from. So he's. What he said is that he got the money from uh, his wife's aunt from Canada, and we published the story, and then citizens really revealed what's going on and how he can't explain the origin of that money. And of course, after that, another smear campaign started <laughs> against us, and his party said that my uh, editor is a drug addict and so on. And uh, uh, to add to all of this, now they are now uh, improving their ways how to, uh, I don't know, trying to intimidate us, trying to, uh, if they think that we will stop doing this job, trying finding new ways uh, how to st stop us. So now <laughs> what is going on is that there are four lawsuits uh, filed against us by one minister in Serbia because of the story we published, uh, which was part of Paradise Papers. So the thing is that now we are spending more mm, time to, to uh, that, that, that we will usually spend on <laughs> investigating than to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. And also money, which is because uh, it depends on how much money he asked for his lawsuits and that was he put the maximum. And, and because of that, we need to pay to more. Is he allowed to do that? To put them to... He is, put, yeah. he is. But the thing is that now, uh, He's not appearing on the court. There are four cases, and for the first time, I should come on the court this Monday. But he's not appearing because he then realized that he's in real trouble because he filed some. Uh, uh, there, there were some really uh, uh, not good uh, information when he reported his property, and that <laughs> that uh, he can't uh, defend now himself, mm -hmm. and now he's trying to stop these cases but the, the judge is not uh, accepting it. She wants to, uh, one of the cases, now he wants to change the judge and so on, so now he's not. But that's one of the ways, and, and there are other ways how, how uh, government wants to, to uh, she's trying to do that. But also I was just thinking of uh, one, the other part of the story is that the support of our readers, which is very important uh -huh. for all of us to, to continue to let's work get on to it. that because that's okay. actually the most important i i hope part yeah, of, of yeah. this discussion but let me just go to hungary and to tomas 
And uh, again, we, we continue speaking about um, Hungary as the, uh, as the textbook case of media capture, where the government in a very sophisticated way over the past decade has built a media capture system systematically, methodically, by taking over regulators, public media, private media, you name it, the sources of funding and so on. So let me, let me ask Tomas, well, first of all, tell us what, what you do and what your organization is doing. And uh, I have a question for you. Is there a moment in time that you can uh, identify where in, in these constant attacks and long-term attacks, uh, you really felt that, that, it's, uh, that you are losing control and you cannot actually do independent journalism? Okay, so my name is Tamás Bodoki. I'm a, a journalist and editor for Atlatso.hu, which is a non-profit center for investigative journalism. We established Atlatso in 2011, and the main goal was to, to, to uh, provide uh, uh, investigative journalism on the non-profit basis, so we don't rely on uh, advertisement or political support, because that's something what already in, it already in 2011 limited the, the, the scope for, for, for uh, mainstream media, uh, because ownership issues, political issues, and economic pressures like advertisers' interests uh, uh, had a bad effect on investigative journalism. Basically, investigative journalists, uh, depending on where they work, the, they couldn't touch certain topics, couldn't touch certain uh, politicians or certain uh, controversies. And our idea was that if we become a, no a non-profit, we don't have this kind of li limitations. So. Uh, speaking about media capture, I think we must go back uh, to the first Orban government, which was between uh, two, uh, uh, 90, 1998 and 2002. And when, when the first Orban government uh, lo lost the elections in 2002, they, they simply blamed the media bias. So they, they, they had the impression that the media was against them, the media was uh, 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 t critical and the, me the me and the media caused that they lost the elections. So what they did, they started a very systematic and long-term uh, uh, building of a media empire, which is uh, uh, which is uh, entirely controlled by the Fidesz party. So even when they were in opposition between 2002 and 2010. They managed to create a news television, a daily paper, radio channels. So they started to, 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 to create their own media enterprises. And, uh, and uh, at the same time, what happened was that Marius already mentioned that the foreign media owners who, who came in the 90s started to sell off their media and sell off their companies uh, to local uh, businessmen uh, who are often very closely connected to, to po local politics and they don't only own media but they have other uh, enterprises as well. So when at the time I worked for Index we had owners who also had businesses in banking, on real estate, uh, who had a close tie to pl politics. So this uh, type of uh, media ownership in the, the 2000s uh, uh, made uh, made uh, the life of the journalists uh, difficult. But the turning point, uh, if, if we have to specify a turning point, it came at 2010 when Fidesz uh, came to power again and they decided that they need a to uh, they need to reshape the whole media landscape and they, they used various uh, methods to to exercise uh, more control over the media. First of all, they changed the media law, uh, then, they, uh, then they occupied the public service media, which is a huge enterprise in Hungary. It can be compared to the Italian public service media, so a lot of channels and a lot of public money going into, into creating public service media. And uh, before 2010, this pu public service media was supposed to be uh, more or less balanced or, 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 or non-partisan. 
uh, but uh, in 2010, basically, they 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 uh, fired all the journalists and editors, and they appointed uh, loyal uh, people who were more loyal to the party and to the government than to the principles of. Uh, of uh, public service journalism, and they turned this uh, huge uh, uh, state-run media service into a, a party propaganda uh, media service. Then, uh, next, uh, what they did, they started to divert p public money into, into media in a way that uh, served a double purpose. So they, call, they, they start huge, uh, very expensive media campaigns, which are called governmental information campaigns. So these are not party uh, campaigns, but uh, government uh, state-run uh, taxpayer-financed media campaigns, which uh, cost a fortune and uh, spread the uh, political message of the governing party and when we took a closer look into who is the who are the beneficiary bene, who benefits from these campaigns we found that uh, almost exclusively this uh, uh, this money was spent at uh, pro government media outlets so so basically they started to finance private media out of the state pocket out of the taxpayers uh, money and at the same time, they cut all the uh, state funding or st state subsidies for uh, critical media or, or uh, ind even independent media, media they, they couldn't uh, control. Because earlier it was uh, common that state-owned companies, big uh, state-owned co companies, spend their um, advertising budgets on both uh, government-leaning and uh, opposition outlets, but this also changed, and now all the state advertising goes to pro-government. So the, the independent media started to shrink. The start, uh, uh, the also, uh, some outlets were closed, some outlets were, were taken over by by the government, like uh, uh, there was the largest political daily paper, Nép Szabadság, which was basically uh, bought by pro-government uh, capital and then closed down, and then the largest uh, news website, Origo, was also acquired by pro-government uh, businesses and then turned into a, a propaganda outlet. So, so I couldn't uh, really define uh, uh, a moment, or if I should, that I would say it was 2010. Mm -hmm. But uh, since then, it is uh, it is a long process, and and even now they are inventing new methods to 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 exercise even more uh, control over ma mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, well, looking at, at at Hungary, it really offers that. An unfortunate barometer of uh, how media freedom is, is 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 worsening, and many many people in many journalists in the region look at Hungary to to uh, compare themselves and to see where they are on the Hungarian scale of media capture. Are we there yet or not? Are we uh, improving? Not not so much improving. But uh, going to Bulgaria, uh, Boriana, you uh, can you tell us a bit about your work? Uh, and and also ab ab about the media landscape in, in Bulgaria as well. And uh, again, after we, we heard, uh, Tomas, can you just put Bulgaria on the uh, Hungarian media capture map? Okay, I'll try. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm a freelance journalist based in Sofia. I cover um, public affairs and human rights um, in Bulgaria as well as in the region. As Marius mentioned earlier, I work for Bulgarian and also foreign publications. I'm also a member of the Association of European Journalists in Bulgaria. It's an um, organization that tries to improve the media landscape in the country and offers workshops and trainings for local journalists. Um, before I go into the Hungarian scale, um, I'll quote a figure that usually you'll find in every story about media freedom uh, in Bulgaria. So 
Yeah, the sentence that you often hear is that Bulgaria has the worst media freedom in the European Union, according to Reporters Without Borders uh, Press Freedom Index. Um, and uh, currently, for the 2017 uh, report, we fell to 111th uh, place out of 180 uh, countries. But, uh, sorry, considering what Thomas just described and what you heard about the media landscape in Serbia, I don't think the situation in Bulgaria is worse than that. So going back to your question, I a don't... Lot of, a lot of competition. Yeah, Bulgaria. exactly, exactly. Uh, we, we always head for the, you know, the, the bottom. We're at the, actually, we're at the top of all the wrong rankings. <laughs> and media freedom is one of them. Uh, but yeah, I would say that we are chasing Hungary, but you're, we're not quite there yet. And unfortunately though, uh, for the past decade, the, media, the state of media freedom in the country has been deteriorating. But, there is one but, we're not Russia or Turkey where you know uh, journalists are being killed and jailed every day. That, that, that's the difference. But unfortunately, the picture is quite grim as well. And I, if you went to some of the other panels on um, media freedom in the region, probably you've heard those, but I just want to uh, paint a few highlights for you. Uh, basically, the lack of transparency when it comes to media ownership is a huge, huge issue, not just for Bulgaria, but throughout the region. Um, we see it everywhere, um, but it gets dangerous when you have like a WACO media mogul and politician um, control much of the press. And it's not rocket science. I mean, Marius mentioned that Hungary is a textbook example, but these guys, WACO oligarchs, media moguls, uh, whatever we call them, it wasn't rocket science for them to figure out that once you have your hands on the media, it's easy to exert political and economic power and to be uh, basically to trade influence. So that's what happened in Bulgaria as well. And um, this local politician and media owner, um, he basically used his newspapers as tools to discredit journalists. To We pretty much see the same smear campaigns as Dragana described in Serbia. Uh, and anybody who is a political opponent, um, investigative journalist, NGO people who uh, dare to criticize uh, the government or to uh, encourage rule of law in the country are being targets. Um, and in Hungary, if you went to some of Mario's other panels, you heard, you know, they like lists of what there, lists of enemy of the people. Well, in Bulgaria, we have books. Mm. So some of these newspapers, instead of publishing lists, they actually, by buying a newspaper which costs less than 50 euro cents, you get a book free of charge with all this uh, inconvenient uh, you know, critics that are trashed and they try to ruin their reputation. And um, yeah, unfortunately, that, that's happening pretty often. Who's writing these books? The uh, the well, people in the government. Actually, there there's no author, but oh, yeah, that, okay. no, no, it's uh, the newspapers. Basically, right. you get it free with the newspaper when you buy a newspaper. Um, this media group and the other interesting phenomenon, for example, is that even though uh, this group of newspapers are source of disinformation and fake news themselves, they have a section in the paper since maybe 2017. Uh, which aims to debunk fake news, what they call fake news, actually. But in fact, these are <laughs> fact-based, <laughs> sometimes investigative pieces, which they deem that they're inconvenient or harmful for their owner. So it's kind of a, I don't know, a piece of twisted reality. And uh, the other problem is, of course, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of tabloid style journalism and a lot of the stories are rife with hate speech. Hate speech, so um, on top of what I just described. So yeah, it's not a 
pretty picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Boriana. It's not, it's not a, a pretty picture, and I, I want to, before opening up for questions, I want to address the issue of solutions, and uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to come to these panels all the time and, and have these questions when you have journalists in the panel. The solution is there. In fact, there are solutions. The fact that they are working and, and doing this job is, is the first proof that uh, things are happening and there is resistance, there is still independent journalism in, in these countries. But um, Dragana, you started to, sp to talk about the reader's reaction and uh, uh, speaking about, about your audience, your supporters, what do you think, uh, what do you think would be the solutions to increase the impact of your work and generally of the work of independent journalists and, and media in the region and in your country in, in particular? The support that we receive from our readers is very important. So important for us, important for me personally, because I'm encouraged enough to continue to do this job. But also, uh, the, it would be better if readers would uh, support more investigative journalists in Serbia by donating, by micro donations. That is something that Tamas and Atlatso is doing really, really well. So. Our idea is just because of that to, to uh, start a real crowdfunding campaign and to, f because it, there is not a lot of money for writing uh, investigative stories in Serbia. So we're all fighting for the s same small amount of money. So in that, in that case, uh, that would be very important. And for example, uh, what we did so far is that we made these publications of our uh, one of the major sto stories that we did. I have a couple of these examples. It's in Serbian, but if anyone wants, can keep the copy. And we also made uh, T-shirts with, uh, with, uh, with the illustration of the story about and from Canada. And that's what something we, that we that we was giving to our readers as a gift uh, for those who were uh, donated us. But also, what is important. That what would be, we tried also to give it to the Minister of Defense once when we found him where there was a book fair and also uh, some kind of media a media fair on the uh, during these days and uh, we heard that he's somewhere there and then we tried to reach him and to give him t-shirt he refused. So, uh, but also what is also important is that other media is following the story when when uh, uh, when it's published. Mm -hmm. But for example, what happened? when we published a story about uh, Ministry of Finance and these apartments in Bulgaria is that one, one of the uh, biggest daily newspapers was following the stories because we were publishing stories uh, each Monday, but then they received messages saying like, okay, Creek is gonna publish something tomorrow, don't you dare to republish it, because then that would affect them, they would, they would not have enough money from the advertisement or something mm -hmm. like that. So. Uh, mainstream media and almost all media are under control, so it's not possible to to uh, to expect that they will uh, republish your story. Usually, how it looks like is that if if uh, a person that is uh, in, uh, that is uh, a guy, a main person from your story, that is uh, the story uh, that if the story is about him. If they react, then the media, like national media, will republish his reaction. But then the readers, they start thinking, okay, he's commenting something, but what? And then they start to uh, being interested to see the story. But uh, what is also important is when uh, are we all in trouble, like, uh, and uh, we need more solidarity be among the mm -hmm. uh, uh, colleagues, and also to be uh, encouraged enough to go in public if you're in danger, or if you just can't do your job as, as a professional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also I will just add this thing, because uh, people in Serbia, uh, sometimes they, they, they think that problem with the media is our own problem, it's not their problem. But then when it comes, when they have their own issue, big issue, then they call us and say like, okay, I'm, I call other media, but they don't want to, to investigate this story. Then they realize that having an independent journalist, investigative journalist is very important. But also uh, they expect from us to do something that is not our job. Uh, we publish the story and, and we will follow what is going on after that, but we are not the ones who will file criminal charges and everything, but mm -hmm. activists and others can, should do that after, after, after we publish the story. So we hope that one day those guys will be uh, on trial, for example. Yeah. Just uh, you said a very interesting thing, the fact that uh, some of the mainstream media do not 
there to publish, to republish some of the investigations. What, how are they controlled? What are, are they afraid of mostly? Is it like funding from the government or is it direct control or other forms of threat? It, it, could be, yeah, it could be funding from the budget, for example, if they apply on, uh, for the money from the budget, uh, most of the money will go to the media that are under control of the mm -hmm. government. Or not just that, some other companies, private companies, because they give money to the political party, whose president is our president uh, Vucic, so their company is not, they just can't give their money to, to, uh, to the, that, those media if they will just publish these kind mm -hmm. of stories, so mm -hmm. that's a problem. But it was different, if I can compare how it was uh, less than 10 years ago. When I started to do this job, we, will, we would publish the story and uh, we will share it on social media and uh, usually people in the government, uh, back then when it was government led by Democratic Party, they would completely ignore it. But now this government just can't ignore Mm -hmm. the stories that we publish and also a big difference is that more and more people in Serbia are use internet, mm -hmm. are on Facebook, uh, Twitter, more and more use is Instagram and so on. So you can't, when it, when it, it's, it's, it's like a bomb, it, it, pff, it goes and you, can, yeah. <laughs> and you just can't stop it. So that's something that helps us to, to spread the story and then they just have to go and, and ask the questions that they didn't want, they, they, because they're always refusing to give us interview before we publish the story. Right, thank you. Well, uh, this is uh, when we, you talked about solutions, solidarity comes back and back in our discussions. Uh, uh, across solidarity among journalists at, at the country level, but also I think very importantly on a more regional and even maybe pan-European level. But solutions, improving your impact, who wants to tackle that? Oriana? Tomas, Tomas. Okay, yes. so I think th uh, we are facing a double challenge with, uh, with Antlat. So one is the financing and the other is distribution. And on the financing side, in a controversial way, this kind of media environment uh, helps us because a lot of people are not satisfied with what the pro-government uh, uh, propaganda machine can offer them as, as news. So they are turning increasingly to to, to independent uh, news sources, and they are willing to finance, uh, willing to donate to, to, to this kind of uh, website. So we were the, Atlas was the first to start a crowdfunding campaign in Hungary, and we are able now uh, to, to collect more than 60% of our revenues from the, from the audience, but also now, all the other independent news sites and media outlets started this kind of campaigns, uh, trying to, to convince their readers that they need to take part in the financing uh, of, the, of, of the news uh, production. But on the other hand, the distribution is a, is a, is a problem because the pro-government media is expanding. It reaches more and more people. It, it, it works in a push mode, so if you are not an active, active news uh, consumer and you're not looking for, for, for independent news, then you only get the government stuff and they never ever will, will carry your news or, or, or republish it, it is out of question. They only carry sm smear campaigns and they try to discredit uh, independent news sources. And, and so we are basically limited to approximately like uh, five to 10% of the population who goes on actively on the internet and look, is, is looking for, for, for the, our website and similar website and and i think there is a challenge which i don't know how can be overcome uh, when atlas started we had like still had like three or four tv stations regularly featuring our work or, or the the newsworthy stories and now it's uh, it's only one uh, TV station left, which is uh, occasionally in, uh, republishing our work. We, uh, we can still manage to have more than 3,000 uh, quotations in other media per year, but these are mostly the similar uh, um, internet-based media which reach a limited audience. So, so I think the 
The problem is that, that uh, I don't see the solution on the distribution side of this, uh, this uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Boriana? Well, obviously, we won't be able to solve uh, the struggles of independent media in less than 60 minutes. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be billionaires we by be now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if I'll try to like sum up some highlights, for example, I think what Dragana says is really important. And for example, OCCRP is doing a pretty good job in that. And I mean, this creating the sense of collaboration uh, support and community uh, between, I mean, within the country, but also in uh, cross-border projects, it's really important because there are a handful of independent outlets and reporters in those countries, so it doesn't make sense to fight between us. It actually it makes sense to fight back. Mm -hmm. The oligarchs, the pro-government pro media and to strengthen the, the free press, basically. So that's one, one way to do it, those, those collaborations and, you know, the stories that they broke about the apartments was helped and researched by colleagues in Bulgaria and, you know, it gets a much bigger impact this way. And also, uh, you know, even trying to reach a uh, bigger audience by publishing, let's say, in English, because sometimes when investigative journalists are doing excellent work, but it's only in local languages, the governments tend to ignore that. But once the story, uh, the story is broke in the international press, for example, and we had a couple of examples like that in Bulgaria recently, then they need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Um, something that Thomas touched on is media innovation, and I'm really happy to see that in the region we see more and more projects like that. You were the first one to crowdfund in Hungary. We see how um, you know media startups in Central and Eastern Europe are increasingly trying to benefit from technology and different uh, online tools to reach well bigger audience and basically to offer an alternative to those. Uh, media capture systems and local oligarchs by, you know, finding new ways for distribution, for example, by starting a digital first publication. You know, they're a good example in Slovakia, Las Den Den who is like a profitable publication three years after the launch. Um, you know, there are outriders in Poland, you know, there is um, the Catori Vista and the House of Journalists in Romania, RICE projects as well, which mm -hmm. are really benefiting of this uh, technolo technological tools. Um, and also, I know it's old school, but I think we need to strengthen and support vocal journalists. Because when you have something happening like the conflict in Ukraine or a journalist in Bulgaria is being killed and you don't have a correspondent in the ground, well, it's problematic. Because facts get mixed up, there, there's speculation. It's really important to actually invest in trainings and building this next generation of, of reporters who subscribe to uh, good journalism standards and ethics. And also for me, I think it's good to raise that next generation of better news consumers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whether through debunking fake news, you know, teaching media literacy as, for example, we do, we have a project about that in Bulgaria for high school students, or just, uh, you know, raising awareness about the importance of being informed. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. It's important because then, um, you know, it's a way to bring trust back into journalism and media because, and I think we see it across the region, the most devastating uh, effect of having this media capture or threats to media freedom is the fact that people don't trust us anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now they don't make the difference between a pro-government or an independent outlet because they think all are bad. And for example, in Bulgaria, only 10% of Bulgarians consider that there is independent media according to a recent poll. And I think they it's are, part... They are quite right, no? They are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm embarrassed to say I'm a journalist, I must admit. Uh, but yeah, building back that trust by you know, doing our job and offering quality reporting, though. I think this is really important, and there are some examples across the region. In fact, uh, I know in Romania, uh, journalists and, and colleagues in NGOs doing work with the young generation, going throughout the, the country and, and doing this uh, media literacy 
projects that are, I think they have quite a lot of impact and it's really important because working with young generations, you build actually the the, uh, the, the media consumers of, of tomorrow. But we have, uh, we have up to probably like 10, 11 minutes for, uh, for questions from the public. I have lots, but uh, I think, I, I think uh, our, our guests here would, would have some questions. So we open the floor, yes. Yes, hello. Um, I'm a freelance journalist from Romania, and I would also like to ask you uh, something about that. What do you think about the present situation of Romania media? So, like in comparison to the media in uh, Serbia, in Hungary, and in Bulgaria, especially given the fact that our anti-corruption department will also be left powerless, probably or not. We'll see how the European Union uh, feels about that. And what do you think um, Romania's perspective, so Romanian media's perspectives are for the future? Uh -huh. And also on the Hungarian scale, so to say, where are we in the region? How do you guys look at us, so to say? So any of you wants Thank to you. compare <laughs> Romania question. with Bulgaria, with Hungary, with the, the Hungarian scale? Uh, well, I, I don't think I'm an expert on that, but maybe you can tell us more. But, um, well, I just mentioned I'm really hopeful and excited to see projects like that. We have a conference last year on media innovation, and we had uh, Vlad from the House of Journalists speaking. And, you know, there's uh, the Wong Form magazine, the Cato Revista, and, uh, you know, Rice Project, uh, who are doing excellent investigative journalism. I think these are really, um, you know, uh, showing us the way, the light at the end of the tunnel. And so from the outside, I mean, I'm not saying uh, that you don't have issues, or, uh, but I see this uh, enthusiasm and this generation of journalists who wanna fight back. And also it's, uh, it's good to see that you have this critical mass that is taking the streets whenever there are, you know, wall amendments that wanna, you know, uh, reverse the fight against corruption. You know, it's funny because uh, we joined the EU together uh, back in 2007, and there's al always this kind of competition who is better at tackling corruption and organized crime. And at some point, uh, Romania was ahead. Uh, I hope this won't be undone, but it's good to see that people are starting to take notice and the media maybe should take part in that by, you know, reporting more on corruption. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Anybody wants to? Yeah, Tomas. I, I just wanted that you. I, I I also not an expert on the Romanian situation, but I guess you have this oligarchic, politically connected media ownership. But but Hungary has also gone to the next step when the oligarchs donate their their media outlets back to basically the party. So they created a big, huge foundation with like. 500 uh, media titles and all these uh, politically connected oligarchs donated their outlets there. So we are we are one step uh, further on the road to uh, w revert to a one-party state and a highly centralized media. So so um, oligarchic media ownership might feel bad, but it's still better than this highly centralized highly centralized uh, state organized uh, media structure. Okay, Hungary is yeah. taking uh, the first place. I, yes. ju uh, <laughs> just, just to add, we, we, are, we are happening to finish a Romanian report, in fact, about journalism this, uh, this week. Um, and just wanted to say that compared to, to, to Hungary or other countries in the region, we see the situation is far from being great in Romania, uh, what, what I can say first of all. But uh, looking at how it has been done in, in Hungary, for example, it took a, a, quite a high level of sophistication to really attack from so many parts, which is not... Uh, which is not the case in, in Romania, simply because you, you, know, you don't have an Orban uh, and politicians are incredibly incompetent. They are really, they, they cannot really build that kind of thing at the moment. So it's, 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 it's bad, but it's not yet there simply because of, you know, you are lucky with, we are lucky with bad politicians. You want to add anything on that? Well, they don't have that kind of Orban yet. Yeah, that kind and of I Vucic. hope you will not, <laughs> or that kind of Vucic yet and i hope you will not have it but uh, i just wanted to add as boren uh, mentioned these protests 
uh, as we can see in Serbia, we can just people on Twitter like posting photos, like look at these Romanians, they're heroes, like wow, they're on the streets for days, like what are we doing? <laughs> and, uh, but as far as I know from our colleagues from Romania, from RISE project and, and others, uh, you're lucky because you don't have this kind of issue the, uh, like uh, surveillance, like agents f from uh, security uh, intelligence agency following you, making photos, then give the photos to tabloids, and then they uh, constantly use it for smear campaign and some other stuff. So you're still lucky to not to be on <laughs> this, this still. Yeah, yeah, and good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, time for maybe, yes, Jeremy. Hi, uh, Jeremy Joker from Transitions in Prague. So when I go attend discussions like this, I'm always surprised that we have two EU countries here, a country on the cusp of at least wanting to join the EU. Do you see that as any part of the solution of trying to get European politicians more interested in these issues, some kind of leverage that they can actually apply on the government? I mean, we saw obviously judiciary questions in Poland, the EU moved, issued some rulings. It seemed to have at least some kind of effect, at least temporarily. What about the media? I mean, why, why are we talking about this without having any kind of hope that the EU will actually do something about it? I was expecting that question. Who wants to? Do you want to start? Or? No, no. <laughs> no, no. Okay, I can say that we are not part of the EU. I can answer the question. So uh, the thing in Serbia is that now government and the EU thinks there are some other bigger issues than its media freedom or human rights. So we are still now wait to resolve Kosovo issue and then after that maybe this will come to the, like now we will take care of these things. So probably that which I don't support that kind of idea because we are going down and down and down. So, uh, and the other thing is that uh, uh, it shouldn't be like w we shouldn't become EU member before we resolve these issues definitely because when we become a part of EU nobody will take will care and and then they probably wouldn't uh, couldn't uh, influence on that whether certain country will resolve issues with with uh, freedom of media like they now can't do that like with Orban who, who is our mm -hmm. friend unfortunately, so that's probably the case uh, uh, about the Serbia, who is not. <laughs> in yeah, the unfortunately, Bulgaria yeah. And, Rumi and, sorry, and Hungary are not good examples of that because this wasn't, you know, actually, it's an interesting coincidence because uh, the deter deterioration of the media freedom in Bulgaria started, well, at least, on the media freedom index it started dropping right after we joined the EU. And I think this is partly because this is not one of the, the topics that has been monitored, uh, you know, um, not unlike corruption and organized crime, for example. And <coughs> the idea behind this panel, for example, is uh, because I do think we need to talk about things before it's too late, before, you know, uh, the Orbans in Europe or of the world are <laughs> multiplied or before journalists get killed. Um, because there was a killing of a, of a female journalist in Bulgaria last year and then we got all the spotlight. But before that, it was really hard actually to convince editors or you know, foreigners, that we should talk about the struggles of independent press in the country. And um, I'm not a politician, I'm not an analyst, I'm a journalist, so I feel very passionate about this topic and I think it's important. I don't have all the answers, uh, but I do think, I don't know if it's like a network or like a safe space where not just to whine about it, but to, uh, to address the issue and maybe raise awareness is one of the ways. 
I'm not yes. sure this is a good answer, but yeah. The, on this note, how, indeed, a very important issue, and I think we, we have to look increasingly into that. The, a problem with you is that it doesn't have mechanisms mm. to concretely intervene in at, at media policy at national level, and that's a, a bigger issue. But increasingly, this issue is being discussed in in Brussels. So hopefully, it will be discussed more. I, I'm for, you want very quickly? Just, uh, shortly, that uh, in in Hungary, the government is constantly trolling the EU. So any criticism. <laughs> And for, from the EU is used as proof that that uh, the Brussels is attacking us, and the Brussels wants to 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 want something wrong to Hungary. So I get, I think the only solution would be to to freeze the European subsidies in case of breach of uh, fundamental values like like press freedom, because any any softer uh, criticism has no value or even helps the helps the government to. To, 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 to alienate the country from the EU. Yeah, thank you. And on, on that note, also uh, because we have to, to free the room for the next, uh, for the next panel, uh, this was great. The, uh, join me in. A, you have yeah, a you solution. Have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stick to that. We can discuss after the panel. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, the panelists, and join me in a round of applause for this wonderful journalist. <laughs>